Hi guys and welcome back to Small Engines Questions and Answers video number 109. And first of all I want to welcome all my new subscribers. Before I get started today I just want to show you guys these two older boat motors. This one here is a Game Fisher 7.5. I believe it has a Tecumseh engine in it. And this here is an older Johnson. I think it's a 10 horsepower. Now I don't know what the value is especially of the old Johnson there. If anybody knows just comment under the video. And I'm not quite sure of the year either on this one. And I don't see a serial number anywhere on it as well. It's quite old because it's really round and big and heavy. The newer ones aren't as rounded or heavy. So it does turn over. Apparently the guy says it did run before. Anyways, just thought I'd show you guys these two older motors. My first question today is about snowblowers. We're not quite in the winter here yet, but questions about snowblowers are coming up in this part of the country. And this guy's question is, which way should the augers be pointing inside my snowblower auger housing? Well, I've got this older MTD snowblower outside, and this is the way that the augers should be pointing inside the housing. I find this question comes up with people when they've taken apart the auger housing taken off the augers and then they're not quite sure which way they go. It's very important that they're pointing in this way because in this case they're able to blow the snow toward the impeller at the back and then the impeller can shoot it out the chute. If they're pointing the opposite way it's not going to blow the snow in the impeller thus your snow blower will not be blowing snow properly. Also you want the fins on the impeller to be pointing counterclockwise or to the left if not, your blower is going to have a hard time blowing the snow again out of the chute. The reason why I'm showing you that is because the fins inside some people's snow blowers here on the impeller end up getting bent the opposite way and then people aren't sure should they be bent back this way or back this way. So by showing you the impeller on the other snow blower you know that these will need to be bent back this way. So they must have hit some pretty hard stuff to bend them back all the way over here. As you can see down here they're bent completely the opposite. And this one here is totally on the other side as well. So if you're working on your snowblower this fall, make sure that the impeller and the augers are pointing the right way. A YouTuber asked me the other day, what do you mean by varnishized gas in some of your videos when you're working on a carburetor? Well, what I mean by varnishized gas is that the gas is old, it's gotten hard from aging, and it's leaving kind of a little film on the carburetor parts, kind of like varnish that you use to varnish furniture it hardens, it's clear, while sometimes old gas becomes the same way so that's why we say the fuel is varnishized. And also old fuel smells a lot like varnish. Now a question I often get and I know I've answered this before in some Q&A videos is what should the gap be between a flywheel and a coil? Well each manufacturer may specify a different gap but what I use often is a business card between the magnet of the flywheel and the coil and then I've tightened up the bolts holding the ignition module or the coil again and it always works for me. So usually any business card will do the trick and you don't need any special tools to do this. Now if your manufacturer recommends a specific gap then make sure to always follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Somebody asked me the other day is it normal to have to choke or prime your chainsaw after you run out of gas? Well the answer to that is yes it's normal because you need to get the fuel back into the fuel lines and up to the carburetor and the best way to do that is either by choking it or priming it if you have a primer on your chainsaw. With this little chainsaw here if I run it out of gas I do have to fully choke it to get it going again. That's perfectly normal. But if you're using it for something there's a lot of fuel left in the fuel tank and you stop it for like a minute or so usually you do not have to put the choke back on to start it if it's already warmed up. A question that came up this summer from YouTubers is do I have to hold my weed eater or grass trimmer wide open when trimming the grass? Somebody told me the other day that their neighbor told them they had to do that. Well the answer to that is no you don't have to hold it wide open just to cut grass. Now if you're cutting really thick grass that nobody did for like a month or two then you're going to have to hold it wide open but if you're just trimming grass that is regularly trimmed you don't need to hold it wide open all the time. Most grass trimmers produce enough RPMs even at low throttle to cut the grass properly. 
You would also want to make sure that you use the right size of string for your specific trimmer. This one here is an FS85. It's got a lot of power, so I don't have to throttle up too much with this one. But if you did have a smaller unit, you would have to throttle up a bit more to get the same cutting power. So it's really important when you go to buy a trimmer that you buy one that is appropriate for your property. A lot of people buy stuff that's way too small for what they're going to do. And then they end up having to run them really hard and they break down prematurely. In a past Q&A video I talked about how sometimes you have to replace a whole carburetor instead of just repairing it because they just will not work properly. Well somebody asked me what causes a carburetor to malfunction to the point that you have to replace the whole thing. Well what happens sometimes is there's a little one-way valve in the carburetor that gets defective. Sometimes there's little tiny passages in the carburetor that you just cannot clean and sometimes it can be for reasons unknown. Like I said, some of these carburetors will just fail. You try to replace the carburetor kit, they will still not run. And at that point, it's just best to replace the whole carburetor. In the US, it's much cheaper to buy a whole carburetor than it is in Canada. So some shops will just replace the carburetor instead of charging somebody labor for working on the carburetor. Because sometimes they still don't know if it will run properly even after they work on it. So they're just better off to put a new carburetor right off the bat. So depending on where you live and what the price of carburetors are, it's a matter of just saving money as opposed to wasting time. Here in Canada, carburetors are a bit more expensive, so I usually try to fix them first before I go the route of replacing a whole carburetor. In my next question, a YouTuber told me he has a Kohler engine like this. After it runs for a while, it starts to backfire and it won't run properly. He's wondering what's causing this. Well, what's likely causing this is the ignition module. I've noticed that on some older Kohler engines like this, the ignition module will fail. You will still have spark, which can be deceiving, but the engine will start acting up from time to time. And a classic symptom will be that it will start and run when the engine is cold, after it warms up, it starts to backfire, doesn't want to run properly, or just quits. You let it sit for a while, you come back, the engine's cold again, it starts up again and it's good for a while and the process keeps happening. Sometimes it will quit just randomly, even if it's not totally warmed up. And usually after you replace the ignition module, it's okay. So that's what I ended up doing on this tractor here, is replacing the ignition module and now it's problem free. Somebody asked me the other day if they put oil inside of a cylinder of an engine with no compression and leave it there for a while, if this will restore the compression of that engine. Well, the answer to that is no. The only way the oil will help is if you do a compression test. It's not going to restore the compression permanently. To restore the compression permanently, you either have to rebuild the engine or replace the cylinder, the piston, and the rings. And if you have a four-cycle engine, you may also want to look at the valves to make sure that they're not leaking. Now, since it's the fall here in Ontario, Canada, a lot of people have been asking me, how should I put away my lawnmower for the winter? Well, I do have a video that shows how to do that. I'm going to post a link to it under this video today. Go and watch it. You're going to see exactly how I do it. Just remember when you watch the video, this is my suggestions. If your manufacturer recommends something different, then make sure to follow their instructions. So that'll be it for today's Q&A. Thanks again for watching, guys. I really appreciate your support and your comments. And again, I want to welcome all my new subscribers. Also, when you're watching my videos, if you see questions from other YouTubers, if you want to answer them, go ahead. I appreciate that because I cannot get at every single question now. It's just gotten so busy. But I have noticed that other YouTubers have been answering other YouTubers' questions, which is great. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you back in two weeks.